92.1 WROI just before the top of the 8 o'clock hour on a sunny Monday morning. We're going to go to the phone lines now and speak with Indiana 2nd District Representative Jackie Walorski. Jackie, can you hear me? And good morning. Good morning, Baron. Yes, I can. Loud and clear. Are you in the district? I am in the district. I oh. leave for D.C. tomorrow morning. Then you are enjoying a glorious day before you head back to the swamp, aren't you? It's about time. I mean, it was all <laughs> cold and rain. You know, I was in um, the central part of Indiana last week. I was driving from um, Elkhart to Indianapolis to Lafayette and then back up to LaPorte County. It was a whole day in the car in central Indiana, and those farmer's fields were underwater. And uh, the lakes had, you know, um, gone over the banks. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm looking at that devastation, we need wind and we need sun. <laughs> so desperately in the state of Indiana. So yesterday was a good one, and it looks like today's a continuation. But we, we will take all we can get because the fields need to dry up here as well. Now, uh, <clears throat> that brings up something I'll ask you about. Uh, a couple years ago, I don't know how long we went from price supports to crop insurance in our farm policy. Uh, with with this kind of stuff happening in the spring where a lot of these people are already starting to look at having to replant, is that a good thing for them? Well, I think maintaining crop insurance for our farmers in this district in the state of Indiana is extremely important. It's come in as a lifesaver for a lot of family farms over the last couple of years because, you know, the springs in Indiana are just um, too hard to predict. And so, you know, they, um, you know, our, our farmers, our, our family farms are incredible risk takers. And so I fought in the last couple of years and will continue to make sure crop insurance stays uh, where it is, and it does not get messed with in this upcoming farm bill. We've had a lot of concern coming from the southern part of our district. You know, folks calling saying, hey, you know, when they do that farm bill, you know, make sure you're, you're, you're there to protect our crop insurance, and we absolutely are. It is essential to, uh, to our farmers in this district. Um, let me ask you this, too, about something that uh, people seem to be starting to get concerned about. Well, before I get to that, uh, with all the stuff that comes in the media so fast and furious, it's like warp speed. Uh, what are the highest priorities? What what I mean, I know we're going to do health care reform again, and I know tax reform is on the horizon. We got a budget bill to get out. Uh, what are we What are we working on hardest in Washington D.C. right now? Well, I'm on the Ways and Means Committee now, and I'm grateful to be there as a Hoosier, uh, making sure that when we look, when we do look at these things like tax reform, which is what we're doing now, 24 seven. You know, the uh, the health care reform came through the House, that's sitting on the Senate side. They will absolutely. Um, you know, make make moves and make tweaks to it. Probably some major pieces. I would imagine that they'll move as well. But having said that, what I do now is uh, we're doing tax reform, and we're you know, we're pretty much eighty percent there with the president from what the House blueprint was released last year, and the president and his economic team we've been meeting with since January. And I think tax reform is one of the most important things we can do to uh, to jumpstart the economy. And so we actually have our first hearing this week, Baron, um, so that. All, every American can hear exactly what is in this plan, where we're driving this, and why. Why we want those corporate tax rates to fall to you know double low double digits, and why we want individual tax rates to fall, and you know what it's going to take to jumpstart the economy. And um, I'm excited. I think it's you know I'm very optimistic. It's going to be one of the greatest um, I think achievements that that a lot of folks will will be able to say that that we are actually able to make in this Congress with this president. Of course, every committee is important, but the Ways and Means Committee is one of the big ones, and it's uh, it's good for Indiana to have somebody on that committee, I would think, yes? Well, you know, we're the largest manufacturing district now, this Indiana 2nd District, and, you know, back in the day we had representation through Chris Chicola, uh, recently Todd Young, who now has moved to the Senate, was also on there as a Hoosier. I just think it's really important um, for this district and for our, for our state, which is the number one uh, manufacturing state. you got to have eyes and ears there that are fighting for common sense kinds of tax reform and, and things that leverage American companies, leverage American farmers, and drive more money back in the pockets of middle-class Americans. And, you know, we can see right now, Baron, why it's important. You can see this starting to play out. Consumer confidence is up. People are spending money. Um, yeah, I was just at a, uh, what's called a power breakfast for the RV industry last week, which is important to everybody in this district because there's all kinds of, you know, little subsidiary component companies all over our district for the RV industry. And um, this is the first time that industry has broken into really the, the younger millennial market. And for the first time, sales are actually increasing and have increased over 
um, adult and senior citizen sales, which means this market just broke ground on another, you know, good couple of decades going for going to the future, which is just, you know, what we want to have happen is, is really beginning to happen. We want all ships to rise in this district, in the state, in the nation. And, you know, we can see where, you know, rolling back a lot of these regulations that, you know, I've talked about for a long time, as we roll those regulations back really quickly in the last couple of months, it's already beginning to spur, untie the hands of a lot of the employers are able to hire, they're able to, you know, be able to plan certain costs, and a lot of this punitive stuff that was happening with the EPA and some of these regulations, that these agencies that were overregulated, we've been able to bring those back already and repeal those. So I think consumer confidence is going to continue on the upward bound, and I think that's good for this district. And I think being on Ways and Means is good, having common sense voices, um, making sure that, you know, we're moving forward with balance, not heavy-handedness, but balance. On the Ways and Means, you'll have a lot to say about what ends up in the final budget. I'm correct about that, right? Well, the budget committee is different than the Ways and Means Committee. Yeah, Ways and Means raises the money, right? That's what. Cor- well, correct. Anything, yeah, anything that's going to be raised um, is going to come through Ways and Means. The budget committee is a totally separate committee. Okay, very good, very good. Then, um, now on that note, though, uh, I, I, we've heard rumblings about all these different agencies that could see cuts, could see hikes, whatever. Is the VA fairly safe right now? Speaking yes. of someone who's in the VA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, the president's made the VA um, one of his top five priorities. You know it's always been priority one with me. And, um, you know, I maintain vigilance with this issue of fighting for veterans every day. It really um, is, to me, one of the greatest honors is to be able to fight for veterans who fought for me. And so, you know, we maintain our vigilance on that. We just had some issues that popped up in uh, Peru and, uh, you know, some some issues that we had some veterans have called and reported some just horrific things and, you know, things that should not be happening and things that, you know, I called and, and um, asked for an investigation from the VA committee. They came, they investigated, they turned their findings into the VA and the VA corroborated the story and said, you know, absolutely, we've got these blaring issues. And so, um, you know, I maintain vigilance there and at the committee level as well. And, um, you know, this is, I feel like we take a couple steps forward with our veterans and, you know, it is a constant, it is a constant push every single day to make sure they get the health care they deserve. And, um, you know, it's sad that in our own district here and right in your neck of the woods that um, we've got issues that, you know, we have to you know, go in and force change and make sure that the folks that are there are absolutely veteran centric. And when we deal with these opioids, like we, you know, we deal with every day that, you know, we can't have doctors and some of the reports that were substantiated down there that are literally tapering people off these opioids without ever seeing them eye to eye, without ever really tapering them. In some cases, the veterans didn't even know they were being tapered. So this is a this is a full time um, watch of vigilance for me and making sure that we fight for these veterans and, and justice actually happens, no matter where it is, no matter As a, in the uh... district or in the state. As a uh, patient at that clinic, when we yes. reported that story... I was obviously a little interested in it, and I'm wondering, um, well, first off, if you're a patient down there at that Peru clinic, uh, obviously it isn't as bad as some places we've heard around the country where you have literally thousands and thousands of these incidents. But uh, if I want to know if I'm one of the people that had an appointment missed or what have you, is there some way I can find that out? Well, you could call our office. You know, we have... um, I was going to say, you guys probably, I mean, if you have that IG report, then you know... Well, this is not an IG report. This is a VA report. And the reason that's important, and, and let me just say this, Baron. Yeah, we're dealing with smaller numbers because this is a rural area, but this shouldn't happen to one veteran. No, it shouldn't and, and happen at all. Not, right. And it's not the headlines, and it's not Arizona, but this is the same kind of stuff. And, you know, I have a bill that I'm pushing right now to get through. It's passed the House a couple of times, and it's, it's this whole issue of accountability with this scheduling system. You know, this is called cooking the books. And you just – you. You know, we're making that illegal. You cannot do that. And um, so I encourage folks, if they have questions, to call my office. Um, you know, we have a Rochester office, and we have a, a, a main Mishawaka office where most of our VA liaisons are. Um, this just shouldn't be happening. And, you know, I would encourage folks, you know, people call us all the time. The majority of the casework that we have in this district is veterans who need help. And so that's where the information came from that we received, and that's why I acted as fast as I could. And the reason it's important that this is a VA report, not an IG report, this isn't the inspector general, you know, that kind of comes in and does like the independent outside third look. This is the VA themselves that looked at this and just basically said, we have a problem. And, you know, this, this situation with opioids 
is is critically dangerous, and um, it's bad enough that you know we're still combating this horrific suicide rate at 22 a day nationally, and we're dealing with these really high power drugs. But it's something else when you go for help, and you don't even know really who's helping you, what they're doing, and not even to be able to continually monitor these veterans as they start lowering these drugs. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is just it's reprehensible. These are things you absolutely cannot do, and I, I won't accept it in the district. We've also heard rumblings about they're talking about maybe closing facilities down around the country and leaving something like, I think it was three or 4,000 positions unfilled, even though I think they've had their hiring freeze lifted in the VA. Are we approaching the personnel problems at all on this, or, or what, what are we doing with that? Well, having been on the VA committee for four years, I can tell you they're desperately trying to hire physicians, and it goes to the issue of a short shortage of physicians around the country. But... Um, you know, when it comes to high-quality employees, the VA's put together what they believe is one of, the, one of the most competitive packages they've ever had. But there is always a need to be hiring additional quality nurses, nurse practitioners, and doctors in the VA. So I would tell you that they're doing everything they can in a nation where everything is so competitive when it comes to issues in healthcare that, that I think they're finding very, very difficult. They've got large shortages. We have shortages in our state as well. And I believe they're trying to address it as fast as they can. For, and I will tell you that, um, you know, I am pro-VA. And, you know, most of the people that are working in the VA are pro-veteran. And that's exactly what we, that's exactly what we all want to have happen. And so, um, you know, I, having been on the committee, um, they've, they've had a shortage of doctors since I've been on the committee, which was, you know, four or five years ago now. So it's a continuing problem, and they're doing everything they can to compete. Very good, then. Uh, let's touch on foreign policy real quick. It's kind of hard to figure out if North Korea wants to get along with the world or not, because every time they talk about talking, then they shoot a missile off into the, I guess it'd be the Sea of Japan. Uh, what's your short-term prognosis on what we're going to do next, and what's the long-term prognosis here? Are we officially looking at trying eventually down the road reunification or perhaps the uh, poorest province in the Chinese empire? What, what are we doing here? Well, I think President Trump's doing a good job with the military minds that he has around him, which are great military minds. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is a big reset, as you mentioned, in foreign policy around the country. And I think that it is important. Um, you know, our previous administration did not address North Korea at all. They allowed him to develop, to research, to continue to move at a rapid progression of his development of nuclear weapons and the ability to carry nuclear material bombs into this country. And what we've been watching over the last eight years is, uh, you know, somebody who's completely out of control with no global parameters on him. And I think when President Trump was elected and saw the vulnerability and, and really what that meant to our safety and, and to um, our interests abroad, I think he's stood up. I think he's been a commander-in-chief, and I think he's letting the world know that he's serious about, um, you know, no, this is no longer a time for wars to be placating each other. It's a time for action. And I think he and Vice President Pence have done a great job in continuing to um, uh, let the American people know what's happening, being very transparent about it, but keeping enough of this stuff quiet and secret that he's not telling the world, including the leader of North Korea, what his plans are. But I think that he's moving in a good direction. I think they are moving the leader of North Korea. I think he is moving. And I think that, you know, we're going to see here uh, more than just tough words. And I think that the actions that he took, that, that Trump took, um, have us to the point we are right now. You know, he was uh, the leader of North Korea was actually saying last week that he would entertain, you know, the potential of communication with the President of the United States, which would be, um, you know, historic. That has really never happened before. So we're in tenuous times. And, you know, when you've had a vacuum in leadership as a commander in chief in this country for the last eight years, um, you know, these tenuous times, I think, you know, are going to continue. These leaders in these nations are actually seeing we have a reset in leadership and we're very serious about protecting our fellow Americans and our interests abroad. So I think um, what's happening is, is good, and I think, it's on a, I think he's got a strategic group around him, including General Mattis, that are making very, very wise, slow, strategic decisions and not sharing them with the world. Very good, then. Again, we're speaking with Indiana 2nd District Congresswoman Jackie Walorski. I know you're pressed for time, Jackie, so you're heading back to Washington, D.C. Uh, on timeline on some of these... Uh, uh, major uh, major moves that you're making um, with the tax reform, the health care reform. Do we think that uh, by the end of the summer and fall coming up, uh, then we'll have some of this stuff done yet within the next I, four or five months, or do we think it's a longer timeline than that? 
I do. You know, on the health care thing, it's just it's the start of the process. It's not the end, and tax reform as well. I feel like we're a little bit further along with tax reform because we've been working that. I mean, our blueprint, as far as the House is concerned, was out over a year ago. And then President Trump came in in January. It's been a day-by-day, 24-7 work on tax reform. So I think that, yeah, I mean, we're going to continue. We're going to take those steps. We're going to continue to move it through the process. And um, uh, your listeners will hear a lot about tax reform in the next couple of months as um, as we continue to work through. It's my being on ways and means. We'll keep you updated. Very good. Very good. Uh, and we have to do all that before we can get to the budget process. Yes, or can you do those simultaneously? Or you know, the the budget process will, will continue to roll out as well. They really aren't. They, they're really not tied together. The budget is its own sovereign committee, um, and having its own function. It won't impede our progress on tax reform at all. Okay, very good. And when you talk about tax reform, you're not talking about just a few notches here and there in different brackets. You're talking major tax reform, a la Reagan in '81 and '82, that level of tax. Yeah, reform. this is major. It, it affects every American. It's. I think it's a good thing. I think it jumpstarts our economy, protects the middle class. You know, if we can actually get through the blueprint plan, which is the plan that we have, individuals would be filling out their tax form on a four by six card. And the IRS would be probably one tenth its size. It would just be literally a customer service uh, revenue receiver, and um, taxes would look totally different than they do today. All right, very good, Jackie. We, as always, we thank you very kindly for your time. We know the listeners appreciate it, and it's always a delight to talk to you. It's always great to talk to you, Baron, especially to start on my Monday morning. So I appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks for the time. You need to convince <laughs> my wife of that. All right, thank you kindly, and have a great Thanks. day. Okay. 